Context and controversy, fan censored and contested books for young people today will be moderated by Elizabeth Levy. Liz is author of over 100 books for children and young adults in a career that has spanned 45 years from Something Queer is Going On to her latest, Amber Brown Horses Around, co-authored with Bruce Coville. She is known for the humor that she brings to the emotional life of her characters. My life as a fifth grade comedian was challenged for exposing situational ethics. Something that she didn't quite know what it meant. <laughs> she has served as chair of the Penn Children's Book Committee with Vera B. Williams and has remained active on the committee working with librarians, <coughs> authors, and publishers to defend many books that have been challenged or censored. And now, Liz, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Cindy. Uh, the title of our uh, panel is quite a mouthful. So I wanted to start with my favorite quote from Marie Sendak to remind us that as we struggle with these issues with 21st century's eyes, the important thing is that kids go to these books for the truth that they may be not able to find anywhere else. And that's the power of really what we are working with today. I'd like to introduce our wonderful and esteemed and experienced panel, Kira Parrott, to my left, I'm challenged directionally, is a reviews director for School Library Journal. Before becoming an editor, she worked as a children's librarian. She's passionate about powerful, inclusive literature for children and teens, and believes libraries are a right, not a privilege. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband and two happy cats, which is good for children's books. <laughs> <laughs> to her left, I'll get this right, Glad we're all moving to the left. Cheryl Wilson <laughs> is Vice President and Editorial Director of Just Us Books, an independent publisher of Black Interest Books for Children and Young Adults. She and her husband, Wade Hudson, founded Just Us Books in 1988 to address the need for more African-American <coughs> children's books. She has authored many books of her own for young children, including Good Morning, A Baby, by, published by Scholastic, and Hands Can by Candlewick Press, and my friend Maya loves to dance from Abrams Books for Young Reader. <coughs> we skipped our thing, so I'm getting a little mixed in my shoes. <coughs> to my <laughs> One, stay with me. <laughs> Allie Bruce is, is uh, the children's librarian at the Bank Street College of Education, where she teaches in the lower and middle school and co-teaches a sixth grade curriculum that explores diversity, identity, and advocacy for children's literature. She's also a librarian for We Need Diverse Books and co-founder of ReadingWhileWhite.com, and she was a member of the 216 Newberry <coughs> uh, Committee. To her left, we're getting there, is Fatima Sheikh, who's the co-author of Children's and Young Adult, uh, current uh, co-chair of the Children's and Young Adult Book Committee at Penn American Center. She's the assistant professor in the Department of Communications and Media Culture at St. Peter's University. Her children's books include Malik, The Jazz of Our Street, on Mardi Gras Day, and her most current book is What Went Missing and What Got Found, a collection of adult short stories. And Andy Ladies is um, at, not at the end, but last but not least, is the manager of the Bank Street Bookstore. Many of you know him. He has launched six book selling companies in the past 30 years, and is the author of the award winning, which I didn't know Andy until I got this, Rebel Bookseller, Why Indie Businesses Represent Everything You Want to Fight For from free speech to buying local to building communities. So he doesn't belong on the panel. <laughs> so I'd like to start with Kira. Uh, and we, I've asked each of them. We do want it as a conversation. But context and sensitivity in this 21st century has become such an issue that I've asked them each to talk a little bit about what that means to them. Sure. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, hi, everyone. So, you know, I have a background as both a, a librarian, 
and now, of course, as an editor, specifically a reviews editor, and someone who oversees um, the publication of thousands of reviews of children's and teen books every year. Um, you know, in my education as a librarian, when I was in library school especially, when I was taught about censorship and thought about it, it was usually um, with that model of, you know, a, a challenge coming through, you know, pitchforks and, you know, angry people coming through the door of the library demanding books to be burned in a pile somewhere. And we spoke a lot about the need for a collection development policy, for procedures, and, you know, um, a process in place for what you do as a librarian, how you defend, how you advocate, how you articulate your reasons uh, for having a book in the collection, and so on. But what I found, both as a librarian and now as an editor, is more of what we've been sort of touching on again and again this morning, which was the soft censorship, that dirty little secret, the sort of stuff that doesn't really get reported anywhere and often is, is happening by librarians or by educators um, out of love or out of fear. Um, I, I just put together a couple recent books. These are just some things that came to the top of my mind recently, but I got an email uh, this week from a librarian, a reviewer, who's wonderful about the book George, um, which is there in the corner. Uh, for those of you who don't know, George is a middle grade novel, a younger middle grade novel, about a third, fourth grader, um, a young transgender girl who is figuring out who she is, who's figuring out what it means to be transgender and, and whether or not she wants to uh, come out to her family and friends and, and what that would mean. Um, it's also about the love of reading and friendship and school and, and just community. Uh, but this librarian said, you know, I bought this book, you guys gave it a best book of the year um, status, and I wanted it in our, our lower school or um, elementary school collection, and my supervisor, um, you know, refuses to put it there. She wants it in the young adult collection because, quote, we don't have those kids in our elementary school. Oh. Um, something similar happened with the Marvels. Um, Brian Selznick book, there is a, a character who is gay. And I've had multiple, you know, really amazing librarians contact me and say, your review didn't mention the fact that there was a gay character. And so I love the book and I read it, but then, you know, I thought, I don't know if I can keep this in my elementary school collection. You know, you probably should have mentioned that in the review because now I've got to make a decision about it. <coughs> and so, you know, as a review editor, I spent a lot of time thinking about what information we put in our reviews. When do we mention that there is a secondary character that's gay? When is it relevant or not? Um, when we were reviewing YA literature, oftentimes we have reviewers who describe in great detail the content of a YA novel, like the sexual content, um, generally speaking, you know, and, and then there's a, there's a scene where they hold hands and then later, you know, the hand moves under the shirt, whatever, you know, it, it'll get very detailed. And so as an editor, you're like, you know, do I leave that in? The, you know, in, in one sense, I have librarians telling me that we need that information because we need to select books that are appropriate for our schools or for our communities. And without that information, I can't do my job. I'm at risk. But at the same time, you know, I'm in a position where I have a lot of control over those lines and, and, and making decisions about, you know, when is putting that information actually harmful to the book and almost a, a form of that soft censorship. Um, it comes up with grade levels too. Uh, there was the case of the book Dime um, by uh, E.R. Frank, and that's a, a, a book about a, a young woman sort of trapped in um, sexual slavery and prostitution. And uh, our reviewer originally gave it a grades 10 and up, and that's sort of the highest level that we grade a book, you know, that's for very mature readers. And I read the book, and I fell in love with it. We started the book. I thought it was an incredible, brave piece of work. Um, the character was like an eighth grader in that, in that book, or would have been had she been regularly in school. And I thought, how can we give a grade level that the, the, the main character in this book, you know, and kids who are actually experiencing um, what she's experiencing wouldn't be able to read, would never be able to find. Um, so anyway, that's just to say that I think there's a, there's a lot of ways that books get um, censored or preemptively censored and sort of slotted into different um, different uh, holes and, and kind of groupings and siloed and, and reviews is one of those ways where that can happen and so you know in my position I try to be really thoughtful about the decisions that we make and and hope that our reviewers are um, bringing that care to their assessments as well our next uh, Cheryl has oh, wrong name. Uh, Cheryl has a wonderful experience, both as a writer and a publisher. And so, Cheryl, could you talk about this combination of sensitivity and 
context that you've been dealing with this obviously all your life. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm so happy to uh, to be here and to speak both as an author and as a publisher. Um, a couple of things come to mind, and I'm going to be wearing both hats, but uh, talking a little bit more about publishing because Just Us Books is a publisher that was uh, started 28 years ago because uh, we felt that there were not enough black interest books in the marketplace. So when you talk about censorship, we're thinking about context, we're thinking about the canon, what books are not there. Um, and I like to think of what Just Us Books does uh, in, in terms of providing an alternative for books that are not there. So books are censored by not being present. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. One of the decisions that Wade and I made very early on in establishing Just Us Books, which actually started out as a self-publisher <coughs> with one book, uh, the Afrobets ABC book that we self-published because a number of, nobody in New York wanted to publish it, so all, all of the big publishers are guilty. Uh, <laughs> um, but we did it just to prove the point that, yeah, there are black children, we had black children, uh, we had parents that wanted books for their children where the child was not marginalized, uh, that they were just full of themselves, um, that there were various kinds of black children, there were six characters rather than just the one black child that did not belong. And I had come up from um, segregated school systems in Virginia, where in 1954 I was the first grader, but by 1956, 57, I was in the third, fourth grade, and we had to take Virginia history. And in Virginia history, of course, Virginia being one of the premier states, uh, uh, Commonwealth, um, you had to study Virginia history to get out of the fourth grade, I think. But <laughs> um, our teacher, when she got to a certain section of the, the history book, would always, okay class, you can put it under your seat. Uh, it was about slavery, and the chapters about slavery actually depicted happy slaves. These were books that were um, designated and selected by the Virginia State whatever committee, and you had to take it. And the, the point of view was that slavery was, you know, sort of all right, and most slaves were treated well, but that didn't really sit too well with all of our black teachers and the principals, so we didn't recognize that. So you may consider that censorship or selectivity, I'm not sure, but it was not, it was outside, it was in the canon, but it should not have been there. Um, what we like to think of then, in terms of what we publish, and one of the decisions that we made is that, one, we would not publish folk tales. Two, we would, yes, you uh, we'll talk about the, the key ingredients. We would not publish animal tales and we would not publish books about slavery. Our uh, focus was to present contemporary children just leading contemporary mm -hmm. lives. So in terms of censorship, I don't know if any of Just Us Books titles have actually been challenged, but I would say in terms of the selection of kinds of subjects that we publish, we uh, employ Sensors, and I spell that S E N S O R rather than C E N S O R, and we can kind of elaborate on that. But again, um, these are some key in ingredients that we use in terms of determining what we put in our books, how we select <coughs> books uh, for the market, uh, how we edit our books, and one thing that is primary in that is really respect for the reader, and I think that. It's got, has got to be something that we talk about. Um, some of the slides in um, Kira's uh, presentation, you'll see the birthday for George Washington, you'll see the other book, uh, Just to Find Dessert. Um, and full disclosure, Just Us Books probably would not have published either one of those books for various reasons, but yeah. that has to do with our publishing philosophy. So um, I guess the, the, the point that I would like to make is that publishers need to have more censors on mm -hmm. when they are selecting mm -hmm. uh, books because they're books that are harmful. Even though we're talking about censorship and what may be fallout for the author, may be fallout for the publisher, what is the effect of the content on <coughs> students, um, children? Um, 
one other thing, next slide yeah. will show uh, a couple of things back the other way. One of the first books, mm -hmm. trade books that I ever was exposed to was Little Black Sambo, and that was in the second and third grade in Mount Hermon Elementary School in Portsmouth, Virginia. And um, I showed this, there are about four slides, you can do the other one. There are various incarnations of it, even though we know that Helen Bradley wrote that book and it, was, uh, it took place in India, it became something that was acceptable <coughs> as a trade book and as a depiction of black people in the United States. And I think it's done irreparable harm to generations and generations mm -hmm. of people uh, just because that was the only book that they saw that represented African Americans or black people or whether you want to call them sample or not. So it, should this book be banned? Should this book not be in schools? Um, we'll come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect segue into uh, Yeah, it really is. Thank you for bringing us there. Yes. Um, there was one more slide. And there are hundreds of yes. variations of this. Burn that in your mouth. So um, thank, you, thank you for bringing us there, and thank you for uh, the conversation so far today, everybody. It's been really, really wonderful. Um, I can talk, actually talk about censorship sort of from both sides. I've had um, experiences where, as a librarian, <coughs> patrons have wanted me to censor books that I'm not willing to censor, and mm. I have had you know, fingers shaken at me, uh, <laughs> metaphorically and <coughs> literally, saying you are being a censor right now. Um, and one of those actually happened just a couple days ago. I was at the uh, protest for Donald Trump came to the Republican gala, the GOP gala in uh, the Hyatt by Grand Central. And I was there protesting. And as I was tweeting from it, um, I got <coughs> targeted by a number of trolls, and most of them just called me a loser. But um, <laughs> there was uh, one who seized upon me and said, um, your, your attempts to silence Trump are the epitome of hate, oppression, and censorship. <laughs> Uh, so, what the, the angle that I'm really interested in talking about censorship from is uh, how I've heard that argument, the that censorship argument, I've seen that and heard it wielded as a weapon to shut down conversations. Uh, I've had this happen where I raise a concern about a book. I say, this book is racist in the following ways. And I've been countered with, we can't have that discussion because it, you are trying to censor this book. We've gotten into censorship territory here rather than artistic merit or quality. And therefore, we're not going to have this conversation. So in those situations, I'm, I'm sort of left thinking, well, what I did wasn't censorship, but that was. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I've been shut down with, how dare you suggest banning it? That's censorship, so shut up. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's something that I think a lot about, and I'm really interested in exploring, exploring that angle. And I love, can you just, why you chose the John oh. Stewart quote, yes. Yes. <laughs> since everybody's having a good time seeing it. This was Allie's choice. Yes, uh, so it's, the, it's good to see the distinction here between free speech and consequence free speech. I think that often those two things are confused. Just because we do have free speech doesn't mean that we have consequence free speech guaranteed. Adam, there's a lot of context to this. Yes, right. <laughs> well, and actually that's why I came here to talk. Um, I came, I told Liz that I wanted to talk about sense and sensitivity. Mm. Because I think that uh, in, our, in the conversation with in context and censorship, we get, um, we're all a little confused about what is good sense and what is being sensitive, right? We're, we're all a little confused. So I'm going to try to give you a little bit from my perspective. I, I grew up to and went to uh, segregated schools, grew up in segregation. Um, so, and I remember when I was a child, um, my family drove from New Orleans to Canada so my dad could get his PhD. So, you know, we, we had a, an experience of both worlds, I guess, uh, but uh, we, were, we were in segregation, and I, and I think about the books. So, but, so what I wanted to talk about, basically, was just let's tackle race, you know? The, the books that have been coming out, that have been censored, have been books about diversity, 
Um, we're talking about race, really. Uh, the books, that, and I'm in a, in a, in a funny position. I'll tell you all my funny position. My funny position is that I'm co-chair of the Children's Committee at Penn. So I find myself very much in favor of the First Amendment and uh, supporting books that I don't necessarily like. Okay. So, so, so I've thought a lot about this. Um, one of the things, like the books in Texas and the birthday cake for George Washington, I said, okay, let's, let's think about race. What, what is race exactly? You know, what are we talking about? We're talking about a social construction when we talk about race. We're talking about something that exists because we have defined it as such, right? Um, uh, we, we, uh, race is sort of the, uh, has given iconic, iconography to uh, sex and violence and crime. We look at, um, we'll, we'll go back, I, did, I don't want to take up too much time, but we can go back to the hot and Todd Venus, and we can go to Willie Horton, and we can go to uh, Trayvon Martin, the boy with the hood, and we can look at these have been icons of this is how we have def defined race, right? We have defined people in these sort of racial stereotypes. Um, so when we're talking about race in the future and books and how to, how to figure this out, we have to realize that when we are dealing with the language of race, that we are dealing with something that has been created. It doesn't really exist. It has been created through words and it has been, and the words uh, uh, have created experiences, the stereotypes have created experiences for each other. And so we are dismantling, we are, re, we are what we're trying to do is like recreate, we're trying to redefine something that was uh, made up to begin with. Right? Now, if you look at, I'm not going to go through the history for brevity, I'm not going to go through, I had a whole history of, of uh, ways that blacks have defined themselves in literature, you know, like from Phyllis Wheatley to Frederick Douglass to W.B. Du Bois, you know, you have gone you, up to um, Lucille uh, Clifton's mm -hmm. Homage to My Hips, I, I, I love that one, <laughs> um, you know, and, and uh, people have defined what it, what, they, there is a canon of African. So when you see books that you know don't fit it, you know, or are not true, how do you defend it, sort of, you know? So, so I'm just going to give you one little, um, and what is that? Is that censorship or not, right? Um, I'm going to give you an example. When, on the Penn Children's Committee, I'm proud to say, for 10 years has been going down to New Orleans. Uh, with authors, authors visit. And the first time we went, we brought a library of books from my daughter's school down to school in New Orleans. But when we were going through the books, I don't know if I even told y'all that, we were going through, through the books, um, there was a book called Beloved Belindy. Does anybody know Beloved Belindy? Beloved Belindy was Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy's mammy. Oh. And it was in my child's library. So when we were packing up the books to go to New Orleans, I told the principal, I said, you know, these kids are kind of traumatized already. I don't know if we need to send the love for Lindy down there, you know? So is that an issue of censorship? I go back to you. Is it, or is it an issue of sensitivity, right? Mm. We have to look and see some of the things that are coming up. Now, I believe very much in the First Amendment. I believe that we have to have, uh, we have to be able to read the books, you know, to see them. Um, they have to be somewhere. They can't be inaccessible. But I also think that we have to be sensitive to about what is what these books contain, and whether we are sort of building on this racist paradigm that has been created through words mm -hmm. by talking about the happy life of beloved Belindy and her slave life, which was not so bad, or are we breaking it down by doing some redefinitions of things? Yes, thank you, Fatima. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, you just said, which I think is really remarkable about books, is that books are <coughs> stable, they are available in multiple copies, and so we can all look at the same book and know it's not going to be changing right away, and we can then talk about it. And that's one of the things that's uh, you know different than say the the internet. It's uh, they're stable, and we have them in common. And so if we disagree with them, or if we have different opinions about them, we know we're talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. We each have a copy. And so that's one of the things that's fascinating about this conversation is because we are actually talking both about the stable book and the idea of good distribution, that we'll all have access to it, or in case we want to have a conversation. And so here we come to the question of the industry and the nature of book distribution and who are the players in the industry and what is the chain of distribution. And a lot of times, in, uh, you were talking about soft censorship, a lot of times there are decisions that are made at different uh, places in the chain of distribution which uh, have impacts on which books each of us get to see. Yeah. Now, I was going to tell a story about uh, myself as a book distributor. I've, as has been mentioned, I have uh, 
been involved with founding six different bookselling companies, and each one had a different kind of positioning and placement. And one of those companies was the Children's Book Fair Company, which ran uh, sales in Chicago for six years at 75 different schools. And I used to have a fair number of religious schools as accounts. And so, whereas in a bookstore, of course, anybody can walk into the bookstore, when you're running book fairs, you go into the schools. And so when I enter an elementary school, that is a world that is very, very well understood by all the participants. And I used to uh, have to run many book fairs simultaneously during school report card pickup week in November of each year. And in the early 90s, I had a number of religious schools where I was running their book fairs nearly simultaneously. And sometimes a box of books that was destined for one religious school would find its way to another religious school. So I would run the book fair at the Solomon Schechter Day School in Northbrook, for instance. And then uh, two days later, I was at Sacred Heart. Uh, uh, in, in, on the north side of Chicago, and uh, I, I used to always deliver the books and would help to set them up, and I would get this, oh, what are these books doing here? And it was a box of Hanukkah books that had made their way to Sacred Heart. And then two days later, I'm at the Muslim Education Center in Morton Grove, and once again, oh, what are these books doing here? It was a box of Christmas books from the Sacred Heart. So th these contexts were... Uh, uh, very powerful, and the parents who were volunteering felt that they had come across something that was anathema. They could not allow the children in the Sacred Heart School, they couldn't see the Solomon Schechter box, and the, the Muslim Education Center parents, they did not want their children to see the Sacred Heart box, and th that's, again, something that wasn't an issue for me in my bookstore, because I could carry books about all the religions in the bookstore, but when I went into the school, were, were they you know, limiting? Were they selecting specifically for their particular context? What books were available? Absolutely. It was, it was under, it wasn't, they didn't even think of it as censorship. It was just appropriate selection of what was going to be in the school. So why is it important then to have the independent bookstore? And of course, when I was born in 1959, there were 10,000 independent bookstores selling new trade books in this country. And by uh, tw uh, 20 years later, there were only 2,000 because we had these big corporations come in and take over the distribution of books. And sim at a similar time frame, there was a massive consolidation in the publishing industry because the big book selling companies had a lot of control over the uh, publishers and the publishers joined together in order to sort of battle economically to get back control against the booksellers. So you had this incredible consolidation happening and one of the things that this did is it had an effect on what books were published and what books were distributed. And so when we're talking about you know, what, what books we all have seen published or withdrawn from the market, we really are talking about very large corporations making decisions about distributing via very large corporations. And that's why it's extremely important to, uh, to launch uh, small publishing companies and small bookstores, independents, who can then take a, you know, publish a book and distribute books and act together uh, in order to make sure that voices that wouldn't normally make it into the mainstream distribution channels get out. So um, those are two points I want to make. One, which is that the context absolutely is going to be controlled site by site, but that we can have public contexts like independent bookstores where an individual owner doesn't answer to anybody but the, but the, the community and the, the public can carry a book that might be unpopular and can say, I'm carrying this book. And uh, I, I did want to show uh, one book where I, uh, I was selling this book in my bookstore in Chicago, Virginia Lee Burton's Life Story. And um, uh, there was a protest down the street from the children's bookstore in Chicago. We, uh, uh, the Biograph Theater was screening The Last Temptation of Christ. This was the late 1980s. And there were, uh, there was, there were uh, uh, religious students from Wheaton College who'd been bussed in, and they were protesting outside of The Last Temptation of Christ screening. And uh, a number of these uh, protesters would come into the children's bookstore just down the street and buy magic markers and poster board in order to make signs about how this was a terrible thing that the... Uh, and so we were selling art supplies to the uh, protesters who were trying to block the screening of the last temptation of Christ. Well, one day I was at the cash register and a customer brought this book up to the cash register and, and, uh, and said, and, and bought it. And I said, oh, I love this book, Life Story, you know, the Evolution. And she said, yes, this is a wonderful book. I'd never heard of this book. And I said, well, it's really remarkable that uh, you know, in the early 60s, this is the author of uh, you know, 
Mike Mulligan and the steam shovel, and what do you know? And then the next customer in line said, what is that book you were talking about? And I said, oh, uh, it's Life's, did you want a copy? And she said, yes. And I ran to the shelf, I got another copy, sold it to her. And the third person in line was one of these protesters who was protesting the last temptation of Christ. And she said, well, it's a good book if you believe in evolution. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, we were there, we were selling it. So the distribution matters. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. I think you know, you pointed out not just that um, that language ends, but the book is a permanent place, and that is a really exciting time and a time of turmoil with language, because language now is changing to include the excluded. Uh, as an early feminist, I worked on he or she. Now I'm having to have my own head changed around how I think of gender, did that make it too binary? So I'm being forced to shift things that I forced people to shift 30 years ago, and it's hard. So I'd like anybody to, to uh, do we become, you become called the politically correct police when you bring this up uh, in a fine dessert and um, all these cakes which were why why all the citizen groups had to do with food it's so we had to talk at twelve, I don't know. <laughs> but in a cake for George Washington, um, clearly were part of this most recent controversy in children's books. So I could anybody address to, about when do we do we push sensitivity too much? When is it, how does it fall in our field? That's a way open question, but I think it's important for us. So, <laughs> <start. laughs> I don't know if this is actually answering it, but um, in the case of some of the books you mentioned, uh, by Dessert and, and the George Washington Cake, um, and, and other books that have come up recently and have been you know, controversial, but different from the reasons we were kind of talking about this morning, that, that we're talking about a sensitivity, we're talking about the work that most of us are trying to do about sort of dismantling some of um, the structural racism and prejudice that, you know, and we're trying to teach kids a, a new way forward. And, and, and so as book evaluators or media evaluators, having, you know, that context and that understanding that, um, no, we don't want to be censors, that, you know, as a librarian, you're like, oh, God, I, I don't want to be that person. But but looking critically at art and at, and at words and at language and, and what, what that impact has on the reader, what history that reinforces or challenges, and then how, you know, how a reader gets the context or doesn't <laughs> that they might need to understand and, and, and really grapple with some of these issues. Um, you know, and I, I, I liked what Andy said about the book being stable, but, but in some ways, like it is, as, as an object, as, as a work of art, it is, but every reader who comes to that work has a different interpretation. And, you know, speaking from my experience as a review editor, I, we did a recent poll last year of our reviewers. Someone asked me, you know, what's the demographics? What do your book reviewers look like? Um, and I didn't know, so we did a survey. Um, and we participated in the Ian Lowe survey, and, you know, shocker, they look a lot like me, you know, which I knew. I knew that was going to happen, and, and so, if the majority of people, you know, evaluating and thinking critically and then articulating um, both good and bad issues in these books look a lot like me, where are our blinders? What are we not seeing? You know, what kind of cultural literacy do we need in order to, um, to, to see some of these problematic elements and, and determine, you know, do kid, does that child reader come into that book, um, you know, are they going to be able to understand and, and sort of appreciate um, maybe a history um, of some of these words, this language, or in the case of a depiction, let's say, of slaves who are smiling? You know, uh, there was a lot of co conversation around that, and um, you know, and it took me on a personal level a while to to sort of figure out how I felt about it, to be honest, because I, you know, at first, to be perfectly frank, I didn't see a problem with that book. I thought it was delightful. I thought it was great, and then all of a sudden, I started hearing mostly on social media commentary and at first I was a little defensive I was I was like well, what, are they, what are they talking about this is that's that's not a problem and then I said you know what that's my experience I didn't experience it as a problem but let me go back and let me read some of this and, and talk with some um, of the critics and um, and my mind was changed honestly and, and I felt that you know I missed some big red flags like why didn't I read it why didn't I interpret it the way that so many other people have, but I come from a very, you know, different experience, and, and it was a very humbling um, moment to say, like, yeah, um, 
you know, we, we don't always have that context and that history. So now when we're working with our reviewers, we're trying to figure out ways, you know, how do we kind of get beyond our own experiences, especially given the fact that most of our reviewers, you know, are white, very, you know, well-educated, um, mostly women, you know, knowing that we're very, homogenous group one how do we diversify that and not be so homogenous um, and bring in different voices but also um, get beyond those blinders um, that it's very easy to sort of get stuck in you know what we think is quality literature what we think is um, good <laughs> and, and right for kids um, does anyone else want to take it and I especially love the idea that it is what the words we use do have consequences and they have consequences in how our readers feel about race and racial, you know, so they, it, it is a powerful <coughs> issue. I, I think words have consequences, but, but images do mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I did read um, um, the case of George Washington and also a, a fine uh, dessert. And I thought that uh, the, there is a danger in both of those books for me. One in the fine dessert is because it's a beautiful, beautiful book. It's a perfect picture book in terms of form, in terms of how uh, the author moved from one generation to the next, from one era to the next. How it, you know, in Connecticut, in Lyme, um, England, in Charleston, um, there are choices though that you can make to illustrate um, a, a story. And I just think that that was an unfortunate choice for me in terms of being a black parent, a mother, someone um, who's worked with uh, lots of, of children, that that beautiful book might be the first book that a child might see that has any expression of or reference to slavery. And it just looked like everybody was having a good time. Uh, and that experience to me in uh, other books that I had read like um, Tom Feeling's uh, Middle Passage, which is a wordless book, but really talks about the entire experience of the Middle Passage in the diaspora is a completely different thing. Or Jelani and the Lock, which is a picture book by a, a sculptor who talks about a young boy who is uh, taken from his homeland and what that meant to him. He couldn't play anymore. He didn't have a mother anymore. It was a very visceral kind of thing. And it, uh, I, I get very passionate about this. But the, the thing is that pictures say a lot. And for young people, young children, who are seeing pictures and are not reading the words and are not reading the author's note at the back or the forward or the back notes, that's what they're going to see. Same thing for George Washington. And um, the, the, I love the artwork for the artist because it's beautiful. I think it's probably inappropriate for that subject. And the subject was pretty much ahistorical because it just didn't present the facts. So when you're presenting something in a historical context or fictionalized context about a subject as important and as impressive as slavery is, and there are plenty of people that think that it didn't exist or that we should still have slaves or, you know, I mean, you know, it just reinforces um, stereotyped imagery that I think it's inappropriate for young children to process. So we've got to talk about the words, but you've got to talk about the impact of those images as well. And I, I think I was just going to ask Allie about historical context, but also in terms of books being written today with microaggressions, even if they're going back in the past, how do we look at the, that context? So I get through 21st century eyes. And, I, I love that we're talking about the historical context of this as a librarian and as a researcher. This is I, I love to just dig in and really find out where where the terms that we use come from. And um, also thank you for focusing on images too, because both of those that there's historic the history, the context, the images, all of that really plays into um, some research that I did in preparation for this panel. Um, so looking at the history of censorship. Not just the, rather than the history of, of race or, or children's literature. Oh, where's the, uh, where's the picture? I don't know where oh. went. Well, there's supposed to be a picture of D.W. Griffith there. Picture. <laughs> Uh, D.W. Griffith was the writer, producer, director of Birth of a Nation and um, Intolerance was the next one after that and then there were about 500 other films. Uh, that's literal. That, that, I didn't put that in as a joke. <laughs> and uh, he was 
the leader of the anti-censorship movement in the early 1900s. Um, and the, the story behind that is that when, they, when he uh, directed and produced Birth of a Nation, which was called the Klansmen at the time, um, the NAACP organized protests and boycotts, and they tried to get some theaters not to show the film, and they were successful in some cases. And D.W. Griffiths took that and used it to paint himself as a victim. And even though the film made tons of money, it was the first blockbuster, it was um, adjusted for inflation, people still estimate that it is the most successful film of all time. Um, he then went on to make this movie called Intolerance, in which he presented four different cases of intolerance throughout history, essentially uh, uh, saying, the, saying that he was Jesus Christ is, is the, the gist of the film. Now, I sat down and watched both of the films. I, I, you know, that's eight hours of my life that I'm never going to get back. And um, uh, took notes the whole time. And the, um, the thing that's really interesting to me is that D.W. Griffiths got to be the one defining censorship. He got to be the one telling the story. Not just the story of the KKK and the story of slavery, he got to tell, he got to be the one defining what tolerance meant. And for him, tolerance meant, I get to tell your story in a way that might get you killed, and when you try to stop me from doing that, I get to call you a censor. And I want to make that real, because when Birth of a Nation came out, it was one of several factors that led directly <coughs> to the um, second coming of the KKK. And people died because of that movie. So when I hear about that censorship being the counter argument to this is a racist book, I try to think about the larger context and the pattern, the power that white people have had throughout history to tell the story and how that seems to me a much bigger form of censorship than any pointing out or criticism or review could ever be. Thank you. Um, I know we're short of time. This has been <coughs> such a wonderful uh, morning. Of, but I do want to say that open it up to some questions from the audience for anybody on the panel. <coughs> Okay. Um, yes. Um, I want to know when you are the kinds of questions you ask yourself as librarians, as publishers, as facilities. When you talk about the type of historical fiction that deals in times when we had very problematic opinions and attitudes in public, what are the kinds of questions you're asking yourself when you're deciding? Question, this is not the only question, but one question that I ask myself is, um, could a ch any child come along and pick up this book and have mm -hmm. that experience of reading it be a safe and affirming experience for them? So th this comes up a lot around books that feature kids playing Indian, and that's something that, you know, the argument is often kids really do play like this, or they really did play like this. And so I always like to back up and say, okay, who do you mean by kids? Like, do you think that native kids played a really grotesque and, ex and horrible version of ourselves? And um, so, and if a native child comes along and picks up that book, or uh, is reading it going to be safe? And I think that it can be if if the playing Indian is dealt with responsibly by the the author and the editor. Then absolutely, it can be in a book. Um, so, but that is one question that I hold in my head is, uh, could this, is this book going to be safe, a safe experience for any child 
who picks Karen, it up? I brought this back up so that if you could just talk a little about why um, why, <laughs> why, 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 why the girl, girl is here. Um, well, that was a, another book that generated a lot of recent um, discussion over the past year um, because there were several, uh, the, the narrator is very young, very naive, she comes from a very small um, uh, town uh, and not very educated or cultured and then moves to the big city and you know, um, a lot of her narration is what we might call unreliable and you know, limited and she has a lot of um, prejudices and, uh, and one is against, you know, or preconceived ideas about Jewish people, um, about Native Americans and there's some like, you know, kind of asides. They're not major to the plot in any way necessarily, but there are asides that she says, um, for example, I think the one about natives was, um, when she's talking about Jewish people also, she says, you know, um, I, you know, I met these, this Jewish family and it was, it was shocking to me because, you know, I thought of them, even though I read Ivanhoe and I knew that they existed, you know, this was like the first time I actually, you know, met them in the flesh and it was almost like uh, Native Americans. Like, I, I, I know that they're, um, I'm trying to remember the exact line, but she makes reference to them talking about um, them being sort of mythical, um, and 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 now they're civilized, or, or something was the aside. And a lot of a, a lot of um, folks were, you know, challenged that and said, okay, you know, this is not an acceptable um, passage. You know, what are kids, what are what are young readers going to make of this? It sort of reinforces a lot of uh, a really damaging stereotypes. On the other side, you have people saying, but. She was of her time. That's how that character would have thought. That's what she would have um, um, said, and given that point in the narrative in her experience. Um, and so, for me, as you know, an evaluator, and what I hope reviewers would do is exactly what Ali said, which was, well, how does that get dealt with later on? Is there a point at the no in the novel um, or in her character arc where she confronts those biases, where she comments on it, or where she, you know, where a different experience will illuminate the to the reader that her previous um, conception was flawed um, and I think you know it's a very tricky line because we're also trying not to be uh, didactic <laughs> we don't want our books to be you know preachy lessons about you know learning something great at the end so how does that happen and does it happen organically does it make sense to the character and to the plot and, and does it feel um, you know right and not overly intentional and that's a really hard thing to do and I don't really have any good answers for you honestly other than I think we have to ask those questions when we're evaluating the literature and sort of grapple with them ourselves. Sorry that's not the best yeah, answer. <laughs> I know we're really out of time but just one last question. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question. Reed Roger, Roger Sutton brought up, I can't find the blog post about being from a public library point of view, the idea that People could not have access to the George Washington book anymore. The, the whole co that, unlike the others, that book was actually withdrawn, so nobody could see it anymore. And I'm curious about your feelings about. There's a lot of con I'm a teacher. A lot of the conversations here about school libraries teaching, but public libraries and the accessibility of controversial books, even the Black Sambo. I'm just curious if that conversation is going on. I think there's something ALA has some kind of <coughs> statement Pen. about this or something. I, I, I'm just curious about that. Pen, so Pen, uh, yeah, was Pen, like Pen uh, worked uh, quite a bit on that statement along with the NCAC um, because we, we believe in the First Amendment and we believe that a book, people should be able to see a book. Mm -hmm. I personally, um, and you know, I wasn't greatly in favor of the book, but but uh, I personally wanted to read the book before I made any judgment. And I called a couple of bookstores, and uh, I was told by one that yes, we have the book, but you can't see it. Right? <laughs> so that really drove home the point to me mm -hmm. that even though I may not agree with a book, maybe, maybe I don't like the way it's uh, logically the way it progresses, or, or, or that uh, it might be inauthentic, right? But I should be able to somewhere to be able to see it and make up my mind. So that that solidified for me First Amendment rights. We have to we have to have the First Amendment, you know, free speech. Yeah. I, I, I think it goes perfectly to what John was going to speak. So do we have to, Cindy, do we have time for one? Yes, um, please, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just to kind of address that, and yeah. I, I'm a member of the Penn, yeah, yeah, Children's sure. Committee, and I stand on the First Amendment as well. But I think there's a distinction between uh, censorship and not having the book available. I did get a copy of that from a librarian friend of mine um, who uh, sent me PDFs. But um, that book was withdrawn by the publisher, and to uh, a lot of protests by uh, 
families and people and you know online and as well and I think because a lot of us have been published by Scholastic and we know the Scholastic is major in all of the schools it's almost the only book fair that goes into uh, schools on a, a big level I, my personal opinion and I don't know this for a fact is that that they made a good decision for their own purposes and for their own reputation um, mm -hmm. Um, and I don't believe that that was censorship per se. They withdrew distribution of the book from the marketplace. Just, just to be clear, of libraries here in the city, you can. Um, we were able to get a copy, New York Public Library, um, via uh, sale on um, side sale on Amazon, and so. We, we got our hands on one copy, and it's in the research library because I think it is very, very important to have these books for the future of Fine Dessert and many of these other books. So in the research setting where you have people coming and looking at this and the history, it's so important that libraries are able to make sure that they collect and hold on to these things so that you can have that framework that can take this conversation from today that we're having that is so important and then be able to really inform ourselves and educate ourselves. Um, and I appreciate all of your, your comments so Paul much. I was saying about being able to have a teachable moment from something that just makes us uncomfortable in this whole morning. There's been a celebration of that. Thank you, my panel, very much. Thank you so much for that wonderful and time.